Updating your application from time to time may require deeper changes that may affect the data layer. When this happens and you have to make changes to the database, it's always important to consider what is going to be the impact for uh, the application, your customers, and how to minimize the risks. Hi, I'm Anto and this is Out of DevOps, a YouTube channel for software engineers. Today we're going to see how to apply database changes using a database migration tool. So for what we're going to do today, code is not strictly necessary, but I wanted to play a little bit with Kotlin and I think it may help with some examples. So I created the microservice using Kotlin and Spring Boot. This uh, collects information like events, so you can uh, post uh, events on uh, one endpoint and you can get the list of events or uh, a single event on uh, another endpoint. The microservice uses a database and the database is managed using Liquibase as a migration tool. So. Let's start looking at the code. So let's start from the REST controller. The REST controller is a simple REST controller that exposes this endpoint, v1 events, and we have a function for the post request, uh, and then two functions for uh, the get request. One for the list of events, and one for retrieving the specific events. So the functions are using a service and the event service. So this event service is passing all the requests to repository interface. This repository interface is a CRUD repository interface where we operate on an event type of object. So if we look at this, this is, this is quite interesting because in, uh, in Kotlin we can have data class where um, we can specify classes that are uh, specifically used for um, using moving data around so this is the service now let's have a look at the database so as i say this uses a database and we are using liquibase as a migration tool for uh, the database so by convention when you have a file like this db changelog master.yaml this one will be automatically picked by spring boot at bootstrap time and we'll execute the liquid based migrations so the liquid based migration as you can see in this file we are including external files so if we open this db changelog 1.0 uh, we can see that we have a table creation with two columns one is id and the other one is name before we start talking about database migration i want to show you how this service works so in order to run the service we need a database so we can do docker run and we can run a postgres database using docker so you can find all the commands in the descriptions there is a link to the website containing all the instructions to run the service and to follow the step-by-step -step tutorial so now we have our database running so if we do docker ps we should be able to see a database um, so a Postgres image running under the test DB image name. So now if I run this and I query the database, we can see we have our test DB doesn't have any, any table. So now when we are going to run the service, what it's going to do by default, we'll pick up this change and we'll apply to the database. So it's going to create a table with these columns. So to run the database, the service, we just click here. So it should start in a couple of seconds. Okay. As you can see in the logs, there is a liquid base part where we acquire a lock and then we run the migrations. And as you can see from the logs, the table event has been created. So now if I look at this and I refresh in the database, we can see there is a new table called event. So now, if we want to insert data into this table, what we can do, um, I've created this HTTP calls uh, file. So this one is what we can use for uh, testing the application. So when I run this, this one is going to call the post event. As you can see, this one passed. Um, so we have our event created we can check that in uh, by inspecting the table so if i refresh the table now we have a new event created so if we want we can create more by running this again and we should be able to see 
additional events created. So, so all these requests hitting the service are also hitting the database because the service is reading and writing from the database. And in uh, the previous video, I discussed about backwards and forwards compatibility in API design. Today, instead, we're going to see how these changes may have an impact on the data layer and how to modify the database without having breaking changes. So before we do that, let's discuss backwards compatible and incompatible changes with regards to a database. So we can have uh, backwards compatible changes in a database when we are, for example, creating a new table or adding a new column, except when we have a not null constraint, in which case we need to add a default value or deleting a, an unused table or an unused column. And these are all backwards compatible changes. Now, if we go back to the code, we can see that there are two files under the dbchangelog folder. One is dbchangelog 1.1 and the other one is changelog 1.2 we can have a look at that later. So if we look at 1.1, what we are doing here, we are adding a new column, and this is, as we said, a backward compatible change. So this new column is named created, contains the type is a timestamp, and has a constraint is non-null. But as we said, if we have a constraint, we must have a default value to avoid failures. So if we wanna run this now, what we need to do, we need to include the call to that file into the um, changelog master. So what we do, we copy this, and we add 1.1. Now, what we need to do, we need to restart our service. So let's have a look again at the database. So the database, still two columns. I'm gonna stop and rerun the database the service. So now, as you can see, a new column has been created. So now if we refresh the database, we can see automatically the column created and populated. So now if we execute the same calls, let's see what is going to happen. So when I run this, calls are running. And if we check, they all passed. If we check the table, instead of two, we should see three so another one has been created with a different timestamp so um, what we have done now is we introduced a change into the database schema that was backward compatible so adding a new column didn't break our service and didn't break our database migrations but as you can imagine there are also changes that are backwards incompatible and classical examples of these are the renaming of a table or renaming of a column. So in this case, if we look at the changelog file 1.2, we are doing a column, uh, we are renaming a column. And if we look at the this, we want to rename the name column into type. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna create this changelog in this way. And we're specifying the old column name and the new column name. At this point, the only thing that we need to do is include this file into our changelog and we do 1.2. So now when we stop the data, when we stop the service and we rerun the service, this will apply the change as we can see from the logs. So the column has been renamed. So if I refresh the table, I can see, so now we have name, if I refresh the table, we're going to see type. So now this one, as you can see, the service is up and running. Nothing is failing for now, but we didn't do any requests. So if we try to make the request using the HTTP calls, let's see what's going to happen. So, but as we can see, all these calls are failing because our service doesn't know anything about the new names that we assign to the column. So every single time it's trying to get right to the events table is not recognizing the new type field that we just created. So as you can see, even a simple change like this can break our service. Let's have a look at how we can apply this type of changes without breaking. So a common way to deal with this type of changes is doing it in multiple steps. Instead of doing the rename of the column directly, what we do, we create another column, then we modify our, the code of our service to deal with both the columns. And once we are done with that, we can uh, start migrating the data from one column to the other. At the end of that, we change the code of our service to only operate with a single column, with, with, with the new column. And at the end, we drop the old column. So 
As you can see, it's much more complicated than just renaming, so there are, there are a number of steps involved. And this is the level of complexity that you should expect every single time you have to modify the data layer in your application. So this was just an example, and obviously it's only relevant for the type of technologies and the service that I'm using in this context. What we can do, instead of going example by example, we can uh, try to discuss what are the recommended practices for uh, database migrations. So the first is roll out schema changes independently from the application changes. This is important because when we bundle application changes and schema changes, we may have the need to roll back and we may create incompatibilities between versions of the service with the database. And I personally even recommend to have an isolated process for deploying the schema changes instead of using the same process but with different code changes. What I mean with that is uh, in our pipeline or in our, um, I don't know, release process, we have a specific process for uh, schema changes and a specific process for application changes. So by design, we can never bundle them together. And the other reason for that is permissions, because every single time you run a schema change, you may probably need higher permissions at database level that are not required for a normal operation. So when you run the service, those permissions are not needed. The other thing is throttling the update. Every single time you have operations like the one described before, where you have to backfill the data into a column. Uh, it's important to do it in batches because two reasons. One, you may have, you may uh, impact the performance of the database. And two, some changes may lock a table and that will uh, stop any write access to the database. So it may have an impact on your service. Another recommendation is to coordinate database changes with uh, scheduled backups. In this way, you ideally you want to have the execution of your uh, change immediately after a backup. So in the worst case scenario, you can always use the most recent backup. And as last recommendation, wait before dropping. So every single time you have to drop a table or a column, make sure you are extremely confident with the previous change that everything has been working fine for a number of days and there are no performance issues. Monitor the statistics of the database and make sure you have a backup before you drop it. That's it. Comment if you have a question, like, subscribe, and see you soon.